Hi, how are you? I'm Ruth Lawler and I'm here at RT today to interview one of Ireland's best known actors and best loved comedians. In 1996, he collaborated with the trio in which he's best known today and the three of them wrote Acre Match. Now, the idea was to inject a little bit of humour into RT, which was sadly lacking at the time. I think it's very safe to say he was successful. Richard, how are you? Delighted with myself. Ruth, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. You studied acting at the Samuel Beckett Centre in Trinity College, am I right? Mm. And then you went on to study acting in New York. Was it perhaps um, a certain teacher that you may have had or a friend, Barry Murphy, on a certain school trip to France that inspired you to go into the entertainment business? My mother was involved in uh, in music. She was a she was a singer, and she met my dad actually in the RTE Singers, and my dad is a singer as well. So um, I was brought up with music and performance, I suppose, as being a very sort of normal thing, which of course we all know it's not. <laughs> it's very abnormal. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was always kind of singing and performing, and uh, I suppose always getting used to. Um, uh, sounds of things and I was always good at repeating sounds of things which is I suppose why I would be um, good at doing voices and, and that kind of thing. So um, I, I was in a school uh, performance of uh, an opera called Amal and the Night Visitors which was actually my mother's school when I was nine and, um, and I suppose she, to answer your question, she was the inspiration behind me getting up on the stage. Okay so then after Trinity you went on to New York was it a lack of opportunities here in Ireland, or um, was it to further your studies that drove you away from us? Uh, to further my studies? No, it was, it was well, it was, it was kind of a combination of the two, really. I, I, um, I, yeah, I graduated from Trinity, and then I was kind of getting bits and pieces of work in Ireland, and I actually just found it very difficult to get an equity card as well, which was, at the time, was ridiculously difficult to get one, because you were told, when I applied for an equity card, I was told that I, I needed more experience to get the equity card. Uh, but then I couldn't get experience without the equity card. So it was a bizarre situation. So I ended up pretending that I had one in order to get work. Okay. And that's why I lied. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the message is lie uh, and, and, and it'll get you somewhere. But um, so that was a frustration in, in Ireland. And um, but eventually I did get an equity card and I got plays. Uh, I got parts in, in plays in, in the Abbey and uh, that kind of thing. And I didn't particularly sort of enjoy the atmosphere in the Abbey at the time. And uh, it seemed to me like, you know, part of my, I suppose, training in, in Trinity was to view working in professional theatre as the ultimate, the pinnacle. And uh, I suppose the National Theatre, the Abbey, uh, would definitely be that pinnacle in Ireland. And it just seemed to be a little bit of an anticlimax. So uh, I got an opportunity to work in New York and I got a, I got a green card, uh, Morrison visa and all that. So I stayed there for a while and, and got, got a nice bit of work over there as well. And was it not lonely going over on your own somewhere like a strange country? Uh, it would have been if I, if I had, but I was actually going over to a girlfriend as well oh. at the time, you see. So <laughs> you got that I was quiet. totally <laughs> sussed. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I went over, I mean, I, I had an awful lot of friends over there and contacts because I had I'd done a couple of tours over there um, as part of a theatre company called the O'Casey Theatre Company, which is, um, the, it was founded by Siobhan O'Casey, Sean O'Casey's daughter. So we ended up travelling around Ireland and Britain and America and I ended up uh, staying in New York for a substantial amount of time so I had a few contacts over there and uh, then when I decided to go over there full time they were there ready and willing to house me for a little while. But if things were going so well for you in New York what made you come home? Like why would you leave everything over there? Well they were going very well initially and um, I you know I got as I was saying to you I, I, I was in the famous Galti ad uh, which, is, which is really the highlight of my career. It's breakfast time back home, uh, Sean. Um, and, and so I got odds and ends and bits and pieces, and uh, I got a lot of theatre work over there, and I suppose the most exciting thing I did over there was actually in Chicago, which was working with a theatre company uh, called Steppenwolf Theatre Company, which uh, John Malkovich and Gary Sinise and all these guys are very synonymous with. And... Uh, and that was the last thing I did there. And I suppose one of the main reasons I, I came back was, uh, I came back in 1996, was because I met my wife. And then normally people go over to America and they meet an American person and get married and they stay over there. But I went over to America and I met an Irish person. And uh, I came back and uh, there was kind of, there was, I suppose that was a, a decision that I made that um, 
uh, it was probably time to time to head back home. So, given your Galta debut, when you returned to Ireland, did you find there were a lot more opportunities for you, a lot more doors opening? Yeah, it was. I mean, when I came back in 19, 19, 1996, uh, Barry Murphy and myself, uh, who was uh, another third of Apre Match, um, we had been sort of working on bits and pieces together and, and essentially like we were sitting in a room uh, uh, to uh, board people and we made each other laugh and uh, it's, that was sort of the, the beginning of our pre-match and, and we, we would go to pubs and watch soccer matches and before we knew it we were kind of, uh, a lot of people were listening to us as opposed to the commentary um, so we thought we'd extend that further and uh, make something of it. So. Um, Barry was presenting this program on the end, uh, and uh, so I was kind of became part of that as well a couple of times. And um, RT got wind of the fact that we were kind of taking the Mickey out of out of soccer. And there's a guy in here called Tony Whelan, who asked us to do um, RT's coverage of uh, the European Championships in 1996. So we did that, and. Um, everything kind of snowballed with that very much from there. Really. And tell me, how would you research your characters? I mean, just sit down and interview them or would you watch live footage of them or any footage at all? Um, no, I'd never, I'd never be, I'd never interview people because I, I, I think they'd know why, you know, why I was doing it. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, no, some, there's some people that I do look at and it's only something I suppose I've started to do lately in that um, it's only really in the last few years where I've really concentrated on doing impressions of people and um, whereas before I was kind of, I suppose, well I still am going between acting roles and doing impressions of people, but uh, with Pat Kenny, for example, I, I, I studied him and um, I, it was cause I, people were saying to me, like, how can you do Pat Kenny? Because he's just like, there's nothing to do. He's just like so stiff. But that in fact is the whole essence of Pat in that he's uh, becomes very maudlin, uh, points his fingers at the camera for no particular reason and uh, decides to talk about 9-11 and the tragedy that was, of course, 9-11. And, you know, he just manages to reduce every, uh, even cheerful subject, to a uh, really doer and, and uh, unpleasant one, really. Now, I know you're happily married. Um, thanks for the flattery there, all the same. But, and I'm not saying that you argue with your wife, but if you were in the middle of an argument with any past girlfriends or wives or wife, would you start doing an impression of them in the middle of the argument just to annoy them a bit more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have actually, uh, but uh, it's um, it, it's more that it's more the way I think we'd all do it, you know, where we go, yeah, but you say that to that, you know, when somebody's kind of nitpicking at you. Now I know Mario Rosenstock and yourself, you have worked together in Aikino, for example, mm. but between you and me, I mean, no one else is going to hear. Is there any rivalry between the two of you? There must be. No, not really. I mean, I mean, of course there is to a to a degree. I mean, we're we're uh, we're in the same business, and and uh, we we both do impressions of, of people and all that. But um, it's very friendly rivalry. And I mean, I, I would be um, I would be the first, as I have done on occasion, to ring to ring or, or leave him a text saying that uh, a particular sketch was was really good. Like I thought his his version of. Um, it was the Mourinho song, actually, uh, the first one he did about uh, uh, technical or dream coat. It was the, it was the um, I can't remember what the name of the song was, but it was in a, his first impression of Mourinho, and it was really, really good. And so I texted him to say that, and he texted me as well to say, you know, that was great or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I suppose there's uh, we we it's a it's a friendly rivalry. I'm, in fact, I'm meeting him for a pint on on Thursday. So really, yeah. So would you, would you would you would you prefer if there was a kind of a, a hatred well, there? Kind of, <laughs> a bit juicier. Um, uh, no, could you do an impression of him maybe, and we could just stir up a bit of you know rivalry. Well, he's very loud. I don't think you've ever actually met him in in, uh, in like Mario, but he's really loud. But he's, he's actually really loud. He goes into places, talks really really loudly all the time. <laughs> uh, he's not lacking in confidence. Okay. That's for sure. Anything else to tell me about him? Um, he's got a very wide bottom. Really? Yeah, it's very wide. Why were you looking? You're married. Well, it, it, there's, it, there's, you can't really avoid it when he's in, when you're sharing a dressing room with him. I've seen him in his underpants. Is there anyone that you'd like to impersonate, or are you working on any new material that we can be looking forward to, or can we look forward to any new sketches from you? There's a couple of people, yeah, that that um, I'm working on. Uh, I'm, I'm actually writing this, uh, what I hope will become a TV series, and. Um, 
it's uh, the idea is there's there's you know I'm focusing on one particular well-known individual that I do an impression of. Uh, it's sort of a day in their life, and Pat Kenny is one of them, and um, uh, Martin Cullen, who's the Minister for Transport, is another, and George Hook is another one, and David O'Leary is probably going to be another one, and of all the of all the new people, um, Michael O'Leary and. Uh, Podrick Harrington is somebody I've kind of been working on, uh, and uh, Podrick Harrington is somebody that I, I've uh, I, I, he kind of talks like that, you know. He's um, but he's also so committed to golf that uh, you can't imagine him doing anything else at all. And he had a child actually, uh, I think about a year ago, and I remember him saying that, uh, you know, it, uh, it's great to have a baby, you know. And you'd imagine like he'd be really delighted to have a baby just just for its own sake but he said it's great to have a baby, you know. And uh, even when I'm holding her in my arms, it's like it, it doesn't affect my swing. You know, which is like the only way he can make it sort of, uh, the only way he can relate to the child is through the fact that it might affect his swing. Well, Richard, the very best of luck to you in any upcoming projects that you do decide to take on in 2006. Thank you so much for joining us today.